Okay, let's address the first topic of this advanced model, which is turbulence modeling, a very important topic, okay? It's very important in CFD, so please, uh, besides now this brief introduction, uh, go to the literature and please learn more about turbulence modeling. So what is turbulence, okay? For, so for the purpose of this training, let us state the following. Now, turbulence, it is uh, on, on a steady, a periodic motion in which all, all three velocity components fluctuate in, in space and time. Every transported quantity shows similar fluctuations, that is pressure, temperature, species, concentration, and so on. Okay, uh, Torrent flows contains a wide range of eddy sizes, or scales or vortices, let's say. So large eddies derive their energy from the mean flow. The size and velocity of these large eddies are on the order of the mean flow, okay? Then we have large, uh, uh, okay, these large eddies are very unstable and they break up forming smaller eddies and also intermediate eddies. Now, so the smallest eddies that we're going to have will convert all this kinetic energy into thermal energy via viscous dissipation. That is, is where turbulence is dissipated, okay? So the behavior of a small eddies is more universal in, in nature. So basically this is a big assumption where we base a lot of the models in turbulence. You no know, saying that smallest scales that are very universal, large scale is the ones that are in the order of the mean flow, very unstable, okay, they are not uniform. And just to, just to, let's take a look at this picture and look at that, here we have this Buoyant, buoyant plume and see that at the beginning you have the flow that is laminar okay you recognize that here okay it's moving in a laminar way and then here you have the turbulent flow okay so between the laminar turbulent flow also we have a region that is called the transition region okay so here you have the onset of the of the instability and you are going to transition to turbulent so look at the difference just by looking at this picture you can see the difference between a laminar and turbulent flow and something very important in turbulent flows they enhance mixing so see that here we see that there is more mixing than in here. But what is important also this transition region is very difficult to solve, okay? In, in turbulence modeling, we try to avoid transition to turbulence, okay? And if you want to solve that, there are very specific uh, models for that, that we're not going to cover that, but have in mind that this is a difficult, difficult area region, not the transition region, and we try to avoid as much, uh, as much as possible. So here we have a few, let's say, images of turbulent and flow. So you have it all around, okay? From more, smaller scales to very large scales. So see that we go in smaller scales, a little bit larger. Then we have atmospheric scales, airplanes. So all around you have turbulence. And see that, that the common that you have here is this a periodic motion, chaotic motion, where you are enhancing mixing all around here, here. So see that here is laminar, they don't set the turbulent, and here you have the mixing same here, okay? Uh, something also interesting about turbulent flow that probably we have in our mind, we think that when you, that turbulent flows that are not good, we should avoid it or they produce more resistance. And this is a classical uh, benchmarking case. And see that in this case, we have a laminar boundary layer here. Okay, and in a laminar boundary layer, okay, the drag coefficient is 0 0.4. But in this case, we have a turbulent boundary layer and the drag coefficient is 0 0.2. So here we, we <coughs> Here we we made the, the boundary layer uh, turbulent by adding here there is some paper and then you make it turbulent. So what is happening here that as the boundary layer is turbulent, it's more energetic and this will delay separation. And remember that when it comes to drag, drag can be divided into two components: pressure drag and skin friction drag. And yes, it is true. Laminar flows, the skin friction drag is lower. Okay, but however, in this case, when you have, when, when you onset, no, the, when you force the flow to be turbulent or the la boundary layer to be turbulent, you increase the skin in friction, but also you are reducing the pressure drag. And here you see you now uh, a representation of this drag decomposition. So uh, turbulent flows, they are not always negative, and sometimes they are very desirable, okay? So here, 
we have two applications, those CFD simulations. So just to show you here, that we start to talk about turbulence models. So see that in this application here, we're using a turbulence model, the K epsilon, and here we're not using turbulence model. So in theory, this is a DNA simulation, okay, or under resolved DNS which just makes no sense by the way. But in any case, so see that they are very different. And this is the effect, this is the job of turbulence models, okay? To get the right behavior. So those are models, okay? We're going to see that we're adding new equations and somehow we need to reproduce what in reality should be the, the behavior of the flow. So see that this is very unrealistic, this behavior here. Okay, so as you measure here, the mass flow as the outlet, you will get that this fan is getting a super, super high efficiency. Instead, in reality, you should have like this, something like this. Another application here, we have the flow about you no know, uh, 3D body, no, we have here this square cylinder and see that different models, they give you different outcomes. So we go from Urans to less to this and laminar, which is DNS. Now laminar means that you are solving the exact Navier Stokes equation with no models. See that you have nice colors, nice representation and since it seems to be okay, probably this is the farthest one from all these three. Okay, but remember, these are just colors, okay, unique to quantify everything. And when we quantify the different results, look at that. The laminar one, this one, the DNS, that probably seems the, the nicer one, is the one that is farther away from the, from the actual results. So see that different models will give you different outcomes. And the Urans is closer to this experimental results. The Urans is this one. So the Urans is not resolving all, all the small fluctuations, it's getting an average value. Okay, so this will be the main difference between no RANS models, Uran models, and less models or less models or scale resolving models, that you are not resolving those small fluctuations. But nevertheless, see that all turbulence models they give you different outcomes. Okay. And just to finish you now this small brief introduction that here another application of the flow about an airfall and um, let's say that probably you already have done this and in CFD since the 80s people is doing this and after all this year it still is not easy to resolve these flows you know into the okay and see turbulence different turbulence models different outcomes okay each turbulence model will give you different outcomes and this is important that you need to understand the theory and you need to know which one which turbulence model is the right one for your application something interesting that also to point out is that predicting the stall is very difficult okay this you have the experimental values and predicting the stall is very difficult okay and usually you need to do to use to predict right the the, the, the point the value and also the behavior you need to use very well calibrated turbulence models so in engineering okay and in cfd most of the, the the flows that you are encounter are turbulent so that is the need okay we need to deal with this and all around CFD, okay, all around you will need to use turbulence model. And there are many more models, but even the other models that you are going to use, they also depend on turbulence. Like multi-phase flows, they depend on turbulence. Combustion depends on turbulence. So this is the most important one. So the goal of turbulence model is to develop equations, closer equations that predict the 10 average velocity, pressure, temperature fields without cal calculating the complete turbulent flow pattern as a function of time okay we know we can do a dns but that is super expensive okay so we need to reduce that computational effort and that's that is what we're doing in turbulence modeling so as i said there is no universal turbulence models since we need to know the capabilities and limitations of all the turbulence models that are, are around and there are many many models okay so simulating turbulence models in any general uh, cfd solver requires selecting the turbulence model, providing initial conditions and boundary conditions for the closer equations of the of the turbulence model, selecting a near wall treatment. Okay, later we're going to see what is this, and choosing our uh, runtime parameters and the numerics. Okay, we have new equations. So remember that we studied that you have Laplacian, convective terms, gradients. You also need to discretize those terms that appear in your closer equations. So it is very challenging. Now modern turbulence flows. Okay, they have an unsteady periodic motion and in reality they are 
on a steady, but then in CFD we use this approximation of a steady flow, so you can approximate it, but have in mind that those results might be very questionable, okay? But it's something that in CFD it is used, and if you are following good practices, it's likely that you are going to get good results. So also you have that all transported uh, quantities will exhibit random variations so in space and time, okay? These flows also are intrinsically three-dimensional, not due to what is known as vortex stretching. However, also in CFD, we can make another assumption, which is 2D flow, so you can look at that as a as a model, okay? Uh, Torrent's models also, they have a strong dependence in initial conditions. However, now, after all these years of developing this theory, the models are becoming less insensitive, but have in mind that they can have a strong uh, dependence on in initial conditions, okay? No need to say that also on the boundary conditions. Uh, okay, so in order to accurately model or resolve these turbulent flows, the simulations, now if you want to get the right truly results, you need to go three-dimensional, time accurate, that is on a steady and fine meshes to resolve all, all these scales, and that is very time consuming, okay? To remind you, you know, let me remind you that you can characterize turbulent flows you now using the Reynolds number, okay? So we know how to compute it. So you also in some kind of flows, now when you are dealing with natural convection, buoyancy, and stuff like that, also you can characterize now when the flow is turbulent or not using the Raleigh number, okay, here you have it. Okay, so these two ways you can use it, and then you are going to have a criterion. So is this number is more than this, the flow is turbulent or no. So here you have it. So use it for external flows. You have that is the, if when you have hydrodynamic bodies, a slender bodies, use it is the Reynolds is more than half a million, it's fully turbulent. Then is you have a bluff body or obstacles. Now, usually around 20,000, it will be like, fully turbulent and then in thermal flows it's something about 24 so 23 2500 okay so depending on your physics you are addressing you will have different criteria but you say you can use this this Reynolds numbers now to characterize when you have a, a turbulent flow it's very important also if before running just to be sure that your 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 flow is turbulent so is the flow is turbulent use turbulence model if your flow is not turbulent it makes no sense using turbulence model so stick with the laminar model okay however you can also use the turbulent model with laminar flow okay but it's not recommended so but as i say most of the engineering applications the, the, the flow is, is turbulent, okay? Then for the rally number, you're going to compute this this ratio rally prime number and usually it's a large number. So it's something in the order of 10 to the to the power of nine and it's fully turbulent. But most of the time, volume flows, they are, they are turbulent. So what happens when we increase the Reynolds number and see that we go back to the cylinder case? So see that at the beginning, you have a laminar flow and see that here you don't have any any fluctuation and you keep increasing and now you're going to have the, those fluctuations know that in this case by the way it's important to mention that vortex shedding is not an indication of turbulent flow you can have vortex shedding and the flow is still laminar okay be careful so one thing that is you are in this region this is easy to simulate you can go and use this this steady hypothesis then when you have this on a steadiness seems to become a little bit more difficult okay because you need to switch to fully on a steady or you can also use the steady hypothesis but be careful okay that the results might be very questionable, okay? So since it starts to become even more challenging as you keep increasing uh, the Reynolds number. As I mentioned also that vorticity does not always mean turbulence, okay? So in this case, the Reynolds is 100 and it's known, no? By the theory and also all the experimental data available that here it is still the flow is laminar, okay? So if you see vortices do not relate those vortices immediately to a turbulent flow, okay, be careful. So let's talk about the, the, the fluctuations. So this is what, what, what we're trying to do, okay? So when you have a turbulent flow, okay, and from our definition, we know that you have these instantaneous fluctuations that can be very small. So the goal in turbulence model is to remove somehow those fluctuations. So when we talk about different treatments, so for instance, in runs, what we do is that we remove everything by averaging, you no. Know, 
the, the, the whole flow and unless we apply a filtering. Okay, so we use different techniques, but our goal is just to remove these instantaneous fluctuations, not the red lines. Okay, so we would like to work in this blue line where we didn't have those fluctuations, so that is easier to resolve. Okay, we're talking about the mean flow. So if we look at the behavior uh, at the profiles, now let's say in a pipe of or the velocity profile, a laminar flow will have a profile like this. Instead, a turbulent prof uh, flow will have this profile. And this is the main difference, okay? So see that in this case, gradient, the velocity gradient toward, uh, uh, normal to the wall is much larger. And this velocity gradient is the one responsible for the uh, increased skin friction. But also look at the velocity profile that is more is flat, okay? So this means that the, the mixing will be better in this case. So see that not necessarily you are going to correlate now that turning flows are bad. So is your goal is having a good mixing or having a good heat transfer, probably this wall is heated and you want to have a good heat transfer rate, you need to use a, a a turbulent flow. Instead, in the laminar flow, see that the skin friction is really low, but the mixing profile is not that good. So, by the way, this is the average profile, so usually we're interested in the average quantities, uh, but in reality, you have instantaneous, you know, something like that, and then you average, you get this one, but you're going to, to have an instantaneous flow. So, talking about the mixing, okay, again, just to stress that one, now in this one, let's say that this was at the wall, turbulence at the wall, but also you can have shear free turbulence okay so this is what happened okay laminar flow then you have a transition region something like that and then in when it's fully turbulent see that you are enhancing mixing okay so here let's say that we're outside the, the influence of the wall so you are just injecting here a dye and then you see the behavior so now let's talk about the boundary layer okay so this will be very that th this is very important for us okay so as most of the time we have wall so the boundary layer can be divided like this you are going to have a laminar boundary layer okay then a transitional region okay so this region is difficult to solve and then you have the fully turbulent uh boundary layer okay so depending on your application sometimes this transition region can be a long one or it can be fully laminar okay but sometimes you're going to have immediately, you're going to transition from laminar to turbulent, or probably in a very small distance, okay? But if you want to capture all these transition phenomena, you need to use some other specific model for that that are very time consuming and we're not going to address, but have in mind that they do exist, so those models. So let's focus here in the turbulent boundary layer. So see that our profile is different. And now also we can divide this profile into different regions. So we can say that we have a viscous soup layer very, very close to the wall. The flow is still is laminar, but that is very, very close to the wall. Then you have a buffer layer, which is a transitional region. Okay, so you go from laminar to turbulent. So again, this buffer layer is transitional and we try to avoid solving this region. And this is the scope okay, of the wall or near wall treatment. Okay, we're going to address this. And then you have the logarithmic uh, layer, which is fully turbulent. Okay, so here your flow is fully turbulent. I have to also to stress on this mention something that this buffer layer is very, very energetic. Okay, it's very energetic and it's not homogeneous among all cases. So different applications they are going to, uh, this is going to have you now different, uh, it's going to cover different regions and it will have different different behaviors and different velocity values, okay? So it's not homogeneous. So this is how you should divide your velocity profile in the boundary layer. So now let's talk about that. In this subdivision, okay, and we have talked about U plus and Y plus, you can represent this physical velocity profile by using normalized, <coughs> normalized units okay so we have this plot y plus u plus okay so this is velocity normalized and this is a distance no normalized okay when you plot this in this diagram see that you can have here the biscuit suit layer it goes up to let's say rouse speaking a y plus of six then you have the buffer layer that is something between six and thirty so this region see that this is a transition from laminar 
to turbulence. And this region, the, the behavior here is not uniform, okay? So here there will be many profiles, okay? So we try to avoid as much as, as possible, you know, fully resolving the, this, this region. Later we're going to see what is that. And then you have this region, okay, the, which is the fully turbulent re region. So there are correlations to predict the behavior here, and also there are correlations to predict the behavior here. However, here there are no correlations, okay, because it changed continuously. So how do we compute the y plus? The y plus is computed like this. So if you look at this, you see that it's very similar to a Reynolds number. So what we're using here is the velocity. It's called the shear velocity. It's the velocity normalized expressed in function of shear stress. Okay, so you have your shear stress and you express your velocity in function of shear stress. And the u plus is computed like this, your velocity and then the, the shear velocity. So to do this plot, what you do is just, you find, you get a position in, in, your, in your domain. Let's say that here, you plot a line normal to the wall, and then you get wall shear stress in this point, you have your velocity profile, and just do this plot, okay? Apply, put the, this equation, solve for this, and you have coordinates because you have the distance normal to the wall, you have the wall shear stress at the point, and you have the velocity along that line. Okay, this is how you do this plot. You should do it also in the region where the flow is, is turbulent, clear. Okay, so talking about the correlations, what I mentioned that you have this plot, and for each of this region, there are correlations. So if you are in the biscuit soup layer, you have this correlation, okay? So u plus is equal to y plus. Okay, then if you are in the logarithmic uh, region, this one you have this correlation. Okay, this is a very well low correlation, the log low. Okay, and using this correlation, you can approximate this, this behavior. Okay, and then in the buffer layer, none of this correlation applies. Okay, so this is why clearly see here now why we, we want to, to avoid this region. So now let's talk about this wall, uh, near wall treatment and wall functions, okay? So when we talk about this, we say that, for instance, wall resolving approach is when you resolve your boundary layer. So see that to resolve the boundary layer, you need to have very fine meshes, okay? So your Y plus, when you are solving your, your equations, you can compute Y plus while you're running. That Y plus needs to be in the order of, of one or two. Okay, so that requires very, very extremely fine meshes. Okay, so here you have some gu some guidelines. Okay, but no doubt that this profile, the, 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 this approach is the most accurate one. But it's from the computational point of view, it's very expensive. It requires very fine meshes. Then you have the wall modeling approach. In the wall modeling approach, we say that we don't want to resolve this region, the buffer layer, we avoid to resolve it, or not to resolve it, we avoid putting the first cell center in this region. Because see here that in the wall resolving, still you are resolving the buffer layer, but the point is that is the first cell center. The first cell center needs to be or in the biscuit soup layer or in the logarithmic layer. Try to avoid putting the first cell center normal to the wall in the buffer layer. So in wall functions, what you do is that within your turbulence model, you are putting another model, another wall black box, okay? So you put your first cell center outside the buffer layer, and then everything that is happening below this, it is being modeled. And how do you model that? Using this correlation. Okay, this correlation has been verified experimental and probably is one of the correlations that have been verified the most by, by the community, okay? There is a lot, plenty of data about this. So this is what happens, okay, when we use. So this is important. Before doing your, your simulation, starting a simulation, you should choose a modeling approach because the mesh that you are going to do will depend you know, on your modeling approach, your Y plus. And then there is something called Y plus insensitive treatments. Okay, this Y plus insensitive is very specific turbulence models. Okay, they are insensitive to the choice, not to your mesh. Okay, so you can have the first cell center in the logarithmic region, or you can be in the viscous layer, or even you can be in the buffer layer. So these models. Okay, they have some correlations to do the blending from one situation to the other, other situation, okay? Because usually when you choose these models, okay, in all your extension of your boundary layer, your Y plus needs to be less than, let's say, less than six. And if you choose this model, your Y plus needs to be more than 30, you know, in the whole extension of the boundary layer. 
Okay, instead in this white plus insensitive, it doesn't matter. It can be less than, than, than one, five, ten, thirty, okay? Automatically will do this, the, will use the right correlation, okay? But not every turbulence model is white plus insensitive. So a little bit just to mention now this application, remember that the mesh is very important in turbulence models. You are going to resolve the scales that you can capture, okay? So in just basically in this picture, I just illustrate that scenario okay so if you are far from the body you are just capturing the the largest scales what you are going to to miss all the smallest scales so if you want to see all the smallest scales you need smaller meshes okay so here we're going to talk about grid size and sub -grid scales okay so grid scales are the scales that needs to be modeled grid size scales is what whatever you can Character with your mesh. So uh, the different model approaches. Okay, so here in this you now <coughs> workflow in this diagram, we have that all the approaches existing. Okay, so we start with runs, U runs. Then we go to the more ac the most more accurate ones, DNS less and DS. Okay, and DS. So between these two, okay, here let, let's do this distinction that we can talk about here: uh, average turbulence models. Okay or Reynolds average. And then here we talk about a scale resolving simulations. Okay, this means that these models resolve all the scales in a space or time, or not all, but try to resolve most of the scale. Instead here, you are averaging everything. You are not interested in resolving all of the scales. For you, it's important getting the average solution, okay? And between these two models, now you have many, many stuff. But interesting to mention that your your mathematical complexity increase in this direction. These models here, from the mathematical point of view, they are very complicated, okay? That you have closer equations, okay? Additional equations, many coefficients. Instead, this is extremely simple, okay? And your computational costs increase in this direction. So this is, from a mathematical point of view, it's very complicated, but from a computational point of view, it's super fast. Instead here, the mathematics behind this is, is not complicated, but from a computational point of view, it requires a lot of a lot of resources. Okay, so here another description. Let me skip here. And just to mention now, the probably the most common turbulence model and RANS turbulence models that you will find around. Okay, so you have spatial armadas, standard k epsilon, realizable k epsilon, standard k omega, and SST k omega. All of them have different closer equations. All of them also will have different uh, boundary conditions, initial conditions. Okay, they change, and also the range of applicability for each one is different. So for instance, I just want to point out here, Spada Almar is a model that was developed is in particular for aeronautical applications. So this model performed very well in that those applications. But then as you move to another application, the performance is not that good. So uh, besides this Spada Almaras, I want to point out these two models, okay, the K Omega. So recall that we mentioned that some models are white plus insensitive, okay? So these family of models, the K omega, these are white plus insensitive, and these are the recommended models, okay? So from now on, this is my best advice. Always use the K omega SST, okay? Of all the turbulence models that you have around, of the RANS family, probably this is the most general one, okay? It performs very well for most of the applications, but it's up to you, okay? There are many models, okay? It's up to you to pick up one. So let's talk about the equations, how we're starting equations. So we start from the exact navier stokes equations or the DNS equations, laminar equations. See that you don't have, here we're not putting any models. So beside this one, then if, if we want to add no the turbulence model, we're going to add additional closer equations, okay? It can be turbulence model, it can be multi-phase flows, it can be combustion, but whatever. So I'm not going into details about the derivation. That is something that you can find in the literature. However, just to point out that these are, and let's work now for, for <clears throat> to simplify the explanation, let's use the incompressible equations, navier stokes So these are your incompressible navier stokes equation, DNAs with no models, and these are your RANS equations, okay? These are the equations that you are actually solving after applying you know, an averaging technique. So see that they are pretty much the same, the only difference is that you have this new term here. This is known as the Reynolds stress. 
that is approximated like this, and then see that all quantities are average. So remember that at the end of the day, we're interested in the mean value. So this is what you are doing, okay? You're applying an averaging technique, and you get these equations, and from that technique also this term will derive. Okay, it disturbs the Reynolds stress is approximated like this. So look at that, this Reynolds stress, you have fluctuations. So remember that this is the thing that we don't want to solve. We want to model fluctuations. When you see prime, means fluctuation in my notation. So as you look at here, see that everything is average besides this Reynolds stress. So turbulence model, modeling consists, consists just in modeling this Reynolds stress or the fluctuations, okay? There is something similar in less simulations, okay? So we use another technique, it's not averaging, we use filtering, but also a, 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 an, a stress, an additional stress term will arise where you have fluctuations and those fluctuations are the ones that you want to filter or to model. Okay, so this is our goal. So now we need to find closer equations how to solve for these fluctuations, okay? So here, just to mention a little bit about this Reynolds stress tensor that there are many ways, okay? So we can directly resolve each of these terms. So by the way, this term is symmetric, okay? This tensor is symmetric. So you have six equations in 3D or three equations in 2D. So you can solve for each term. So that is what is called Reynolds stress models, okay? But those are very elaborated, okay? And probably they, from <clears throat> they are the most sound Torrance models in, in, the, in this run family, but they are very time consuming, expensive, and they are not easy to use. Now, sometimes it's not easy to, to find no boundary conditions. So instead of using Reynolds stress, there is another approach, okay? Approximating this term using the, what, what is known as the Businex hypothesis. So if we use this Businex hypothesis, we can approximate it, okay? This term can be approximated like this. Okay, so see that this is similar now to the hypothesis that we take with Newtonian flows now that the stress is proportional, is proportional to some quantity to the gradient. Okay, so see that it's something similar. So we use the Businex hypothesis, and now by using this Businex hypothesis, see that the fluctuations, fluctuations disappeared, and now we have everything, no gradients, this gradients in, in function of the mean quantities. And we have this new term here, okay, this next extra term where you have this variable called K, which is the turbulent eddy viscosity. So we need to find a closure for this quantity, okay? So this is where uh, turbulence models enter. So if you, if you insert, no, this, uh, this hypothesis, the business hypothesis into your exact equations here, you're going to get these equations. This is known as the solvable equation, and this is what we are actually solving. So see that now everything is exp expressed in function of mean quantities, okay? So see that you have mean quantities, by the way, you have this new variable also, mu t, okay? So it's a proportionality constant just to fit to get the good results. So this is the turbulent viscosity. It is a fully artificial quantity, but it's that quantity that we need to add, okay, to get the right results. So what we're going to do now is just somehow we need to find this, this quantity, okay? But also we need to approximate K. So this is what we have, okay? So the solvable equations are this one. So see that we know everything. We need just to find the closer for this equation. This one, K also can be approximated or we can get a closer equation for this one. So this is the main goal of turbulence modeling, okay? So now let's talk about our closer equations, okay? And there are many approaches, okay? So the one that I want to just briefly explain you, okay, and here was some of the extra remarks where I mentioned that, okay, I show you just this <clears throat> about the Rans equation, so how we do that, roughly speaking now, but for less less we proceed in a, in a similar way, okay? But instead of using averaging, we use filtering, and then we're going to to to, to need to, to model or, or filter something that we call the SGS stress tensor, okay? So let's take a like, look at the governing equation of the K omega Rans model, okay? So this is the family of models that I specific, specifically recommend you recommend to use. Yeah, recommend recommend use. So uh, something important also when you are dealing with turbulence models, also you need to know what a specific turbulence model you are you are you are using. So see that in this case, 
I'm talking about the Wilcox 1998 revision model, okay, version. But there are many versions, so you need to know the specific one because each one is different, okay? So in this version of the K-Omega, the two uh, closer equations, and it's called two equation model because you have two additional closer equations, are this one. You have an equation for K and for Omega. There is a derivation behind these equations. I'm not going into details. You can go into the literature and you, you can see how they are derived. Okay, there is a, some logic behind this. Okay, but these are the equations that you are solving. So see that everything it is expressed in terms of mean quantities. So now what we need to do is just using these two quantities, we need to compute mu t. So see that at the end of the day, this is what we want to compute. And everything that we do is just to find some dimensional groups. And very important is you check the units of these two additional variables that are artificial variables, okay? You will see that you get the unit of viscosity, okay, for this, for the total and quantity. So this is what we want to do, okay? So all these coefficients that you have here has been calibrated now using canonical solutions, experiments, okay, or DNA simulations, okay, has been calibrated, okay, and it's known that they work, but also there are some limitations, okay, there are in some cases that maybe these coefficients, they require some recalibration, okay, but most of the time, the default coefficients are okay, but this is what we're doing, okay, we saw, we, we start from the solve level equations, our goal is to approximate somehow mu t, then we introduce closer equations, in this case, two equations, and from these two equations, we compute mu t, and we're done. So that now, the question is, what about boundary conditions, free string and initial conditions? Because we have these new variables, so each total and model will have different ways to define tho those values. And you need to give these values, and you need to give physically realistic values, okay? Because they can be these models can be very dependent on this. So for K, for instance, you can approximate it like this, and for Omega, you can approximate it like this. So if you are working with external aerodynamics, you can use these guidelines, okay? So you can say that I, the turbulence intensity, is equal, let's say I have a low turbulence intensity, 1%, you put it here, that will be 0 0.01, and then you know your free stream velocity, and you get K, the turbulent kinetic energy. The same will be, for the for omega okay the specific dissipation rate so if you are using a, a low turbulence intensity the added viscosity ratio you put it one so you're using medium you put it 10 okay so these are some guidelines okay that you are going to find in the literature there are many ways to, to approximate that so this is how you can get initial values at the inlets or outlet but also the values that you are going to use to initialize your flow Okay. However, we're still missing something because like the walls, we need to define these values and they are different. Okay, so these are free string conditions. And here, well, just to mention that, uh, as I say, that every Torrance model will have different relations. Also in the literature, you are going to find different relations no, to, to get this estimate. I'm showing this one, but probably if you open a book, you're going to find something else. But at the end of the day, they are similar. But this is the advice, not what I mentioned, that you need to know the Torrance model. You need to, to open and go to the literature, okay? And know what specific Torrance model and go to that specific paper and look at what the authors recommend as uh, equations or relations to get the estimate. And just to show you that we have this link here, this is a very nice link. So you go here, okay, you will see here turbulence models and you have many of them, okay? Also, you, you can go in the internet, you have CFDN lines, you have many books, okay, and you will find th those correlations. But here, okay, for instance, let me go to the K omega ST. See here that you get enter here and first look at what I mentioned. It's very important to know the specific version that you are using. So see that there are many versions of the SST. Okay, and see that always they give you the reference paper so you can go and find that reference paper. And each of these models, they have different no closer equations or coefficients. But see the interesting here, the boundary conditions recommended in the original reference are these. So in this case, See that they recommend this, which is different from what I'm giving, okay? But at the end, they are very similar. 
and see that at the wall they also recommend some some wonder conditions and it will be the same for the Spalas almaras okay see that you enter Spala almaras probably this is the the model that <laughs> has been modified the most in the literature when it comes in to tournaments but see that they will have many variants and see that here again you will see that recommended boundary conditions and so on so as you go also for the k epsilon it's called k epsilon because you have two equations you now k kinetic energy and epsilon that is another variable that you use to compute mu t and see that here again they are recommended so this is very important get familiar know what specific tournaments model you are using so, as I say, my advice is stick with this one. K omega ST, you have an open front. This is the one that I'm going to use, okay? So here, as you go here, you, you're going to get all the recommendations. Another link that I would recommend you, probably let me do some self-publicity. So, we have a, a, a one semester course in turbulence modeling. So here I'm trying to put in about one hour now Tornus modeling, which is really difficult, but as you go here, okay, in my web page teaching, and here Tornus modeling, and you have the latest year. Here you are going to find all the lectures, okay, regarding Tornus modeling. So here there is a specific lecture, practical turbulence estimates. So you can go here and see now all the different correlations that you can use. You can have here all the equations. You can see the derivation of the Rand's equation, all the steps, the business equ equation, also the derivation of the K equation, omega equation, if you want to see. But for our purposes, that is not important. But let me go here and open this one. And here, well, there is this method called the like method, and then you can get all your estimates, okay? So, for instance, integral length scales, how you can estimate k, epsilon, omega, whatever, depending on your tolerance model, okay? So, here I show you different, different uh, correlations, okay? So, the important is that you need to give physically realistic values, okay, to, to, the, <coughs> to your tolerance quantities. So, let's continue here. So then when it comes to the uh, wall, wall condition, uh, boundary condition at the walls, you need to define that, okay? So here you have some guidelines now. So remember that it's your Y plus, let's say roughly speaking, is between 30 and 300. This value can be larger, okay? It can be up probably to 1,000. You use wall functions, Y plus insensitive, Y plus between 1 and 300. And the wall resolving approach, usually roughly speaking, we say one Y plus is less than six and you need to cluster a lot of cells because you need to resolve the velocity profile, okay? So depending on your approach is you want to use wall functions or resolve boundary layer, okay? The resolve approach, you need to define different boundary conditions. So this is how they are defined. And this is uh, specific to open form, okay? The names that you see here, okay? This is a specific to open form. So for instance, in the K omega, it is recommended, okay? This is the literature that to use this value, okay? Close to the wall, is you are using wall function. So see that this value, Y, is the distance normal to, normal to the wall, okay? From the wall to the first cell center. And see that usually this distance is very small, so this quantity, omega, usually is a large quantity. Okay, so at the wall for omega, you give a value that usually is a large value. And if you are resolving, pretty much is the same. But when it comes to K, if you are using wall functions, the value at the wall will be the same value as the free string. Okay, so you can use kind of a zero gradient and extrapolate it. But the, you use this wall function that actually is a zero gradient. But if you are resolving, you know that if you are resolving the, there are, you are in the la, you are resolving the viscous layer, there are no fluctuations, so it is recommended to use k. You can put it equal to zero or this one. Okay, very close. Uh, that that is specific for low red. Low red means resolve the boundary layer. Okay, so be careful. The high red means wall functions. Low red means resolve the boundary layer, okay? This is not low Reynolds refer to the Reynolds number of the system. It's the Reynolds number, let's say, normal to the wall, okay? So, if you are resolving boundary layer, 
this is small if you are using world functions this is large okay so that, that is what is referring so be careful that also you need to define that okay so each turbulence model you see that for instance you use the k epsilon you need to define epsilon if you are using spiral and matters you define nu tilde okay and r is for the of the Reynolds stresses so in OpenFund, there are many turbulence models. Here you have the location of the source code, so you can go there, open your source code, explore that, and see what, what turbulence model you have. And as I mentioned, use the K-Omega family models. Okay, That is, let's say, the most universal one, but also the realizable K-Exilon is a good, good model. Okay, And just to show you here about the source code, that let me go here. So, if you go into your source code, you will have it here, Momentum, ta, 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 ta. Momentum Transport Models, and if I go Phase Incompressible, let me see, you're going to find all your turbulence models. Remember that you can also use RAS, okay, you have a specific models for multi-phase flows, and here okay bam 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 ras so see that you have all these runs they call it ras but it's the widely used now <coughs> nomenclature uh, acronym is runs so see that you have all these turbulence models so for instance if you want go here k omega sst open the dot h file and as you go here it will give you some some description okay so in this case it's not telling much because this is it belongs to another model that later we can go but let me go k omega let me see if you find it here okay so i see that the k omega 2006 see that it's giving you the reference okay so you can go here look at these two references so by the way this is a beautiful reference uh Look for this reference and see, uh, see the theory, read the theory read, uh, there. They're going to tell you what is it, the boundary conditions, free stream values, what you need to do at the wall, what are the limitations, and so on. So if you go to the KX, you know, for instance, see here that you have a KX you know, and you have re reference, the references there. Okay, so just explore there and let's see if we can do it also with OF9. So for one info K Epsilon. Okay, so you can you also use K Epsilon and let's do two. So say that also K for one info. So let me go for instance K Omega SST and you have different options here and i am interested in let's say three option let's say three or one no it's one so i interested in one so see that here you have the base model and here you have okay so your references all should be here base k omega sst and see that you have the reference the paper and as I say, you have also the, the NASA website, okay? And see that they use coefficients and you have there the default coefficients, okay? So most of the time using the default coefficients, it, it is okay. I'm not going to address that one, but you can also change those coefficients, okay? But you need to know what, what you're doing. So that's how you explore that. Also, you can do the same with less models. You have many less models implemented. So the big question is, uh, what about this Y plus? Because this Y plus, you never know that value a priori. You need to launch the simulation and then you need to compute the value. But there are also some correlations that you can use to approximate Y plus. So for instance, you can proceed like this. First, compute your Reynolds number. Then you can go and compute the friction coefficient, OK? the skin friction coefficient, depending on your application. So there are many correlations. This is a correlation. So this is a particular correlation for flat plate. That might work well if you're working with airfoils, but if you're working with pipe, maybe use a correlation for pipe, or if you have a better correlation, use it. But the idea is just get a skin friction coefficient. Then you can approximate the wall shear stress like this. Now that you have this value, 
compute the shear velocity, you know the density, and now put the shear velocity here. So this is the y plus equation, but I'm solving for y. So let's say my, my decided value of y plus will be 100. I will aim for 100, meaning wall function. Put 100 here. Put your estimated value here for shear velocity. Put your physical properties, and you're going to get this. So that will be the distance from the wall so to the felt sense center. So you just, at meshing time, you can put it there. Do your mesh, but again, you, you need to run your simulation to verify that. But however, this, this correlation works most of the time. Also just in, in this link, okay, we have a calculator now in our website, so you can put the values. But we're using here a correlation for a flat plane. So let's say that my, I'm aiming for a Y plus of 100. See, that is telling me that the distance from the wall to the cell center is 0 0.02 meters. So when you are doing the mesh, you, yeah, you can estimate that and have your mesh ready now for the torrent simulation. Uh, so talking about wall distance units, we talk about this Y plus, okay? And be careful that the Y plus, it is uh, the distance from the wall to the cell center, okay? But also, these two distances are, are important. Okay, delta X plus and delta Z plus. These are important if you are doing less simulations. In runs, pretty much, it's not important, but if you are doing less or DNS, you should also monitor these two distances because here you also have requirements. So here you have how to compute those distances. You see that also they depend on the shear velocity and in the mesh dimension, and you know all those values. So see that the requirements that is that is unique to resolve those distances see that you have it here so if you are wall resolving see that your delta x delta z needs to be roughly speaking less than 50 and if you are wall modeling roughly speaking you have it like this and you will see that these are if you follow the, the these requirements your mesh as the at the surface will be very 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 fine and this is the price that you pay for less simulations okay instead if you are doing runs and runs you you need to to pay much attention for that. So you need to have a, a mesh good enough that it will resolve the curvature, that's all. Okay, so finally some, some, some guidelines, okay? So later you can read this, okay? But very important, use the K omega SST, okay? It's the one I recommend you go ahead and always use that one, okay? Of all tolerance models is the most general one. So at this point, I'm done with this theory. Now we're going to move to two tutorials, okay? We're going to see how to set up cases. So thank you for your attention and see you in the next video. Bye.